Hello, welcome to the Psych 487 Capstone History and Systems Lecture about Psychoanalysis. I'm Dr. Eric Landrum from the Department of Psychology at Boise State University. So let's get started. So first off is we'll follow our usual pattern about antecedents to psychoanalysis. We'll talk about some of the details regarding the uh, development and contributions, and then finally the criticisms of the psychoanalytic movement. Its formal founding is established by historians around 1895, and one of the things that we forget sometimes is that even though that I tend to discuss these topics in a linear fashion, uh, they really didn't happen um, one at a time. And so I think this slide does a nice job of providing information about that. And so psychoanalysis obviously overlaps with other historical developments within the history of psychology. So for example, Wundt is 63 years old, Titchener's 28 years old in his second year at Cornell. You know, Watson's a teenager, the founder of behaviorism, uh, Wertheimer, one of the key players in Gestalt psychology is 15 years old. And so psychoanalysis is going to overlap with a number of different systems of psychology emerging at psychology's beginnings, at least psychology's formal beginnings. Really, the formal beginnings of psychology as compared with the beginnings of psychoanalysis are related only temporally. And what that means is that only in that they happen at the same time, but they're truly not uh, related disciplines. And I'll try to make this, uh, this detail more salient here in a bit. You know, psychology, the schools of psychology develop from an, an academic heritage. They come out of universities. Uh, there's a very pure interest in how the brain works, how the mind works, you know, both the structure and function of the human brain and the mind. So those early psychologists have an interest in perception, sensation, and learning. Their goal is pure science. They want to understand the pieces and parts, the structures, the functions, and that's the founding of psychology. Psychoanalysis is really not a school or a system of psychology. It's different from mainstream psychology. It's separate. It's overlapping and it tends to be influential and be influenced by psychology. So the subject matter of psychoanalysis is abnormal behavior. Its methods are clinical observations. And its theory is based on the theory of unconscious or subconscious. At the same time, in the late 1800s, psychology does not share that school of thought does not share that interest. Really, and as you've heard me allude to before, and as I'll continue to talk about, psychology really doesn't get on the bandwagon of clinical psychology and helping people until 1945, till the right around the conclusion of World War II, where we've got a lot of injured veterans coming home with both physical and mental challenges from their service during the Second World War. And so uh, psychoanalysis has a much longer tradition of being in the, one of the helping professions, so to speak, than psychology does. Freud, to, to be honest, is going to be labeled a genius by many historians in, in, of science and in psychology. But just to be clear about what he did and didn't contribute, Freud did not have the original idea to consider consciousness, but his efforts kind of brought it to the forefront. He kind of made it bubble up to the surface, literally and figuratively, but um bum -tsh. And he found a way to study consciousness in such a way that it's going to make it much more widespread, much more accepted in science and um, human behavior circles of study. So Freud re revolted against the treatment of mentally disturbed. And by the way, in the history of psychology, we've seen this a number of times where a movement in psychology is a revolution about uh, the previous movement or the previous system. Now, there have been a couple of exceptions to that. If you think about, uh, oh, uh, John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner with behaviorism, neo-behaviorism, that was more of a, of a revolution. Uh, and so that actually does share some similar traits to what uh, Freud did. And so he wasn't uh, really uh, against a system, so to speak, but his concern was about the treatment, treatment of the mentally ill. And so in the Middle Ages, you know, this, these ideas vary from uh, time to time and person to person, but the mind is a free agent. The treatment for mental illness in the Middle Ages in the Middle Ages would have been blame and punishment. If you look for the causes, the underlying factors that are leading to a mental illness, it would have been wickedness, witchcraft, possession by demons. And so you can imagine, you know, what some of the uh, treatments would have been. Typically, you would uh, 
um, do something to the person on their body to try to shed the demons or to draw out the wickedness. The Renaissance, uh, the treatment of mentally ill gets a little bit better, but not by much. Um, by the 19th century, it's become more humane, although sometimes it's still pretty surprising that in the 1800s we're still treating the people the way that they were treated. Uh, and it becomes a more humane and rational attitude towards the mentally ill. So the treatments, however, as I just kind of alluded to, were sometimes primitive and sometimes harmful in themselves. And so um, the first U.S. psychiatrist would be Benjamin Rush, and you see that he lived from 1745 to 1813. And he tried a variety of methods, and, the, the, and he posited that mental problems are due to a number of reasons. And so too little or too much blood. And so uh, trephining was one of the techniques, with another fancy name for bloodletting. And so if you thought that a person who was exhibiting schizophrenic tendencies, and by the way, they may not have had the label schizophrenia at the time, but someone who was mentally disordered or disabled, um, and you believe that the cause of that disorder was too much blood, well, the logical thing to do would be to let some of the blood out of the body. And the problem with that is that second bullet point there, where it says the treatments, however, were sometimes primitive and harmful in themselves. So you can imagine, you know, slicing a hole in someone's vein or artery, letting some blood out, stopping that, and, you know, and, you know, the risk of infection and, and things that come from, uh, allowing that system to be opened up, that cardiovascular system, um, you can imagine the uh, flaws in that, uh, the ultimate flaws in that level of thinking. Uh, dunking into a tub of water or vice grips on the forehead. And so so there, there are some good underlying things coming out of this, such that, you know, rather than punish the mentally ill, there's an attempt to treat the mentally ill. Of course, the problem that you see is, is that the treatments aren't going to be overly effective. Uh, I'm not so sure there's ever been any, in, in current science, mental disorder where the release of blood will solve the problem of that person who's disabled. And so the underlying, you know, silver lining, so to speak, is that rather than punish the mentally disturbed or the mentally ill, we're going to attempt to treat them. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the treatments were vastly and grossly ineffective for a long, long time until psychiatry, psychology, and psychoanalysis can grow up together. And with the help of chemistry and biochemistry, we can actually understand how the brain works and how the body works and so forth. So, you know, and here I'm just going to try to summarize what I said a minute ago. The Rush, you know, Benjamin Rush's contribution, obviously, is that he realized that his patients were sick. He tried to help them rather than to institutionalize them and get them out of mainstream society. Benjamin Rush uh, established the first hospital in the United States for the exclusive treatment of emotional disorders. And so his contributions are pretty key. Now, the zeitgeist at the time, remember, zeitgeist is that uh, German word that literally translates as time ghost. We typically call it the spirit of the times. The zeitgeist at the time, we're talking about the late 1800s now and the founding of psychoanalysis, is hedonism or being hedonistic. So, striving to gain pleasure and avoid pain. Now, to give you a little sense of the climate in which... Uh, Sigmund Freud as an adult is going to emerge and have his influence on psychoanalysis. You can see the notes there. It was a sexually permissive and open society uh, where um, the expression of that sexuality was not accompanied by feelings of guilt and repression. Actually, the word libido is already in use before Freud uses it. And actually, Freud's idea of defining the word libido, uh, that, that sexual energy, that life force uh, type of idea, had already been defined in culture. And Freud's uh, definition kind of reinforces that. And of course, Freud's going to make it much more popularized than it was before he came along. So Freud's genius, really, as you listen to and talk to and read about the historians of the history in psychology will tell you is that it's Freud's genius is his ability to draw all this together. So he has this big, large understanding. He takes in these theories. He kind of makes them their own. He impinges ideas from his own life. And I'll tell you some of those stories here in a minute. And then he studies it over a career and makes it very popular. And Freud's influence to this day in psychology and also popular culture is undeniable. 
I mean, there are very few people in the history of science who are as popularized, as well-known as Sigmund Freud. And so he has an immense influence uh, continuing to this day, not only in psychology, but in popular culture as well. So here he is. Here's a picture. Freud lives from 1856 to 1939. Born in Czechoslovakia. He and his family moved to Leipzig. Then he's going to end up in Vienna. Uh, his father is strict and authoritarian. He feels fear and love. His mother is protective and loving. He felt compassion and attachment. Uh, Sigmund Freud develops this notion that he labels the Oedipus complex, where a child at a, around age three, four, five, in this case for Oedipus complex, it's a boy specifically, uh, has a fear of father and then a sexual attraction for mother. And the idea is that a complex has to be resolved for a child to have a healthy adulthood. And so if you have the Oedipus complex as a boy, and Freud would, would suggest that all boys do this, and, and he and to be honest with you, where he gets this idea is from his own life. And so interestingly, he has these feelings of him, himself growing up. And then he, as he becomes a scientist and he studies and he goes to med school, he figures, well, if I had this experience, it must be a universal experience. So every boy goes through this notion of the Oedipus complex. And so this Oedipus complex happens around age four or five. You fear your mother. You have a sexual, I'm sorry, you have a fear of your father. You have a sexual attraction to your mother. There's a jealousy there. So you start to hate your father because he has what you can't have with your mother. And so the notion that Freud had is that this is a complex and it must be resolved. And so if it doesn't get resolved as a child, it will have implications in your future adulthood, which may cause to disordered thinking or the development of some sort of syndrome. By the way, ladies, let's be careful here because we are an equal opportunity employer. And so Freud also posited a little bit later that the women go through the same thing as little girls. He called that the Electra complex. So in the Electra complex, you have a fear and hatred of your mother, you have a sexual attraction to your father, and and if you resolve that, you'll be fine as an adult. If you don't, you're going to have some issues growing up. So Freud begins his medical training, he goes to med school, so he's not trained in psychology, and again, in 1873, that would have been extremely difficult to do. You would have gone uh, to Leipzig and studied with Wundt at the time, and so psychology is just at its beginning, so... Freud goes to med school. He begins with biology. He uh, works as a lab assistant. He dissects over 400 male eels looking for the precise structure of the testes. It's kind of unclear as to what kind of influence, if at all, that might have had on his later interest in sex and sexuality. Uh, he follows his that work in physiology. He examines the spinal cord of the fish also in great detail as he is uh, studying in med school. He used cocaine, and by the way, this isn't this isn't tawdry or scandalous. Cocaine was actually legalized for quite some time. In fact, um, cocaine was one of the original agreements in Coca-Cola, which bears part of its name, Coca, from cocaine. And interestingly enough, that is a way to gain market share. Think about it. You put cocaine in your product and you're going to have repeat business. And so cocaine eventually becomes outlawed. It actually became a prescription medication for some time before it becomes outlawed in the 20th century, at least in the United States. So he uses cocaine, uh, Sigmund Freud does, he introduces it into his medical practice, he feels that it cures depression, helped with his chronic indigestion, which by the way it actually does, it has all kinds of dangerous side effects and it's highly addictive and you develop physical and psychological dependence, but it actually has some restorative properties. Uh, Sigmund Freud receives his uh, medical doctorate, his uh, MD, in uh, 1881. He opens a practice in 1882, and he gets married four years later in 1886. He forms, in, in his, as he forms his own medical practice, he forms a really important relationship with Joseph, sorry, Joseph Breuer, a renowned physician at the time. And they would get together and they would discuss patients, you know, kind of a professional, professional collegial relationship. And they often discussed one of his patients who became very famously known as Anna O. So Anna O was one of Breuer's patients, not one of Freud's patients. And Anna O was seeing Breuer uh, because she had these hysterical symptoms of paralysis, memory loss, mental deterioration, nausea, and disturbances of vision and speech. Now, before we go any further, let me pause here and say that the word hysterical is very sexist and it's a pejorative term. 
because hysterical comes from the same root word as hysterectomy does. And so it is, by definition, a very sexist term. And so I'd recommend staying away from that, even though a lot of people don't know that uh, that origin of the word. Uh, it is very sexist. Anyway, so Anna O oh presents these symptoms to Breuer. And, and Breuer, well, we'll talk about that part of the story here in a minute. But Breuer and Freud uh, consult together with one another. They talk about, uh, as colleagues, uh, what Breuer's treatments of Anna O oh are going to be. And so Freud initially adopted some of Breuer's methods of hypnosis and catharsis, but eventually drops hypnosis. And so hypnosis would be, you know, the very clinical, not the stage type of hypnosis, but lying back on a couch, concentrating, counting backwards, or highly relaxed state. Catharsis is would be what we would call the talking cure. So by talking, conversation, by asking key questions, by chronicling those answers, a therapist might help. Uh, be able to guide a person to some insights about themselves that would lead to some growth and hopefully help overcome some sort of disordered pattern of thinking. And so so Freud is going to uh, initially adopt Breuer's techniques of hypnosis and catharsis, but eventually Freud is going to drop hypnosis. Freud does develop the technique of free association, which is that spontaneous expression of ideas. And so this would be, as you see in movies and cartoons all the time, the stereotypical lying back on the couch. I'm going to say something. I want you to say the first word that pops into your head. Don't edit. Don't censor. Just say the first thing. And so this is actually pretty uh, significant in that Freud develops this. He is the inventor, the creator of this technique of free association. And you can imagine over Freud's uh, lifetime of a career, seeing thousands and thousands of patients, that he would f formulate theories about the types of responses. And so you've asked people, give them a certain prompt and what they asked back, what they answered back, excuse me. And then you do this repeatedly. You try to collect a little bit of data. You record it in some case records for uh, clients you're seeing. And Freud, over time, developed some patterns. Uh, he noticed some patterns that would emerge. And I'll actually give you some examples of that a little bit later in this lecture. And so the two main themes, though, as he uses this free association technique for years and years with thousands of patients, these two things tend to reemerge over and over. Uh, the free associations about childhood and childhood experiences, and then sex and sexuality. And those are going to be the themes that he's, he's going to notice as he comes upon his particular interpretations of, of responses. And so um, those are going to become key underlying factors and drivers in Freud's theories, uh, childhood experiences and sex and sexuality. In 1895, uh, Breuer and Freud publish a book, uh, his Studies on Hysteria. And so they have this collaboration here. Freud and Breuer uh, have uh, differing opinions about causes of uh, neurotic behaviors or neuroses at the time. Uh, we don't use that term anymore in the DSM-5, uh, DSM-4R revised, the DSM-5 that's about to be released. Um, but it was very common for the first couple of editions. Um, and it's still a term, you know, neurotic is still a term that's used in psychological circles. It's just not a specific diagnosis anymore. So Freud's idea was that sex and sexuality was the sole cause of neur neurosis. And Breuer disagreed with that. He didn't, he thought that... Uh, Freud was taking too much of a leap with the evidence. Uh, he didn't have enough evidence to make such a so strong statement that sex was the sole cause of neurosis. And Breuer and Freud, who who formed this collaboration, who were colleagues and collegial to one another, published a book together in 1895. And by 1898, they have a total separation of their friendship and their professional relationship. And by the way, not that we're going to delve too much more into Freud's interpersonal, you know, workings and his family life and things like that, but this is going to be a fairly common occurrence for Freud. And I, there'll be at least a couple more examples that'll come along in this lecture. And so Freud, in other words, would bond with someone, be a collaborator, and then they would break it off. And so you'll see this with Carl Jung. You'll see this with Alfred Adler as well. And so this is a pretty typical pattern. Um, you know, you share ideas, you share passion, you want to be scientists together, you want to contribute to our understanding of human behavior. They pair up for a while, they collaborate, and then there's a parting of the ways. And, and in their own event, in their own essence, uh, Carl Jung and Alfred Adler go on to make huge contributions 
to uh, psychology and how we think about human behavior and especially psychotherapy. 1897, uh, Freud invents an entirely new process he calls dream analysis. Although dreams have been interpreted for thousands of years, he tries to be more systematic and scientific about it using that training and medical background. The, and so the idea of dream analysis is that everything has a cause, so dreams must also be caused by something, and dreams are then interpretable and because, because they mean something else. And so these images must be symbolic and originate in the unconscious. And that dreaming is that kind of transitory state where some of those ideas from the unconscious bubble up to the surface and are processed during our dreams while we're sleeping. And so uh, just to kind of continue the hit parade of really important contributions of Freud, uh, in 1900 he publishes The Interpretation of Dreams, which is based on those first three years of dream analysis and the patterns and the observations that he makes. And historians will tend to say that this is uh, Freud's most important and most influential work. It's widely read. And in this book, he, uh, he also includes a self-analysis of his own dreams. A young man in a used bookstore in Zurich reads the book and becomes interested, and that young man is Carl Jung. And Jung is eventually going to uh, go and study with Freud. They're going to collaborate. They're actually going to travel to America. They're going to be part of an anniversary celebration in 1909 at Clark University. And then a couple of years later, they're going to break apart, as the pattern I've already uh, expressed to you will happen. So Freud, in addition to these, and these are major contributions if you stop and think about it. So uh, he has this idea about um, uh, interpreting dreams. He has this notion of uh, free association. He develops this notion that we still talk about to this day called the Freudian slip. The, the, those casual slips of the tongue are actual reflections of real unacknowledged motives. So think about it. If you had any one of those contributions, if you saw that pattern and brought it to the forefront of society and culture, that would be amazing. Freud keeps doing this over and over in his career, which is really spectacular. You can start to understand why some people are going to call him a genius, because he kind of pulls all these ideas together, as well as invents new ways uh, that are going to be adopted by others. And so uh, we still talk about Freudian slips. We still do uh, dream analysis. I mean, these are ideas that have stayed with us to this day. Here, I already kind of previewed this, but 1909, both Freud and Jung and the, uh, a whole world full of famous scientists and, and psychologists are invited to Clark University to speak uh, at the 20th anniversary of that founding of that university. Um, he meets William James. Uh, he meets uh, Cattell. He meets Titchener. Um, you can see the quote on the screen there. Uh, Freud has a difficult time. He, he obviously has got to come over on a boat, return on a boat. Uh, Freud dislikes America. This is a direct quote from Sigmund Freud. America is a mistake, a gigantic mistake. It is true, but nonetheless a mistake. Um, there's some famous pictures that I've already shown you in class where you've got a front row and a back row. And the three men in the front row are... Um, Sigmund Freud, G. Stanley Hall, who's the president of Clark University, who extends the invitation, and Carl Jung. Um, I've already mentioned that there are people who are who Freud's going to collaborate with and break apart from, and those that breaking apart, they're eventually labeled defectors from the theory of psychoanalysis. Uh, Alfred Adler by 1911, Carl Jung by 1914. So they have a good long run of work together, but then they tend to go their separate ways. In the 1920s, psychoanalysis develops as a system for understanding all human behavior, not just as a therapeutic technique for treating the mentally disturbed. This is another really interesting development for Sigmund Freud. So Sigmund Freud starts out with this idea of helping those with abnormal behaviors, of understanding the symptoms, the causes, and then coming up with treatments that are much more humane than those in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and even in the early 1700s. And so as it starts out as a way to understand abnormal behavior over the course of Freud's career, he becomes more interested in all behavior, including normal healthy behaviors. And in that 
essence, he develops a psychoanalytic system of personality or a theory of personality uh, that is not just limited to the assistance of those who are mentally ill. And so this becomes a huge contribution because Freud takes this very specialized area, area of treating mental illness and he broadens it to this situation where now we can start to understand and gain insight about all human behaviors, not just the behaviors of the mentally ill or mentally disturbed. In 1933, uh, as world events take place, the Nazis come into power in Berlin. Freud's works are burnt. This is one of my favorite quotes. I think it's really amazing. At the time, Freud commented, What progress we are making. In the Middle Ages, they would have burnt me. Nowadays, they are content with burning my books. I, I really like that quote for a lot of different reasons. I think it's very insightful and uh, an interesting observation of the... Uh, challenges of the early 20th century. Freud dies in 1939. All right, so just to kind of recap some of the ideas here, because they are, uh, they, they do tend to make uh, large contributions to, to psychology today, including the things that folks are going to be learning about if they go into clinical and counseling psychology programs, as well as all kinds of other uh, human services uh, um, programs around the country in different disciplines. So free association, uh, this notion of, you know, lying down on the couch, I'm going to say a word, you say any word that comes to your mind, don't edit, don't censor, eventually meet some, so, so the notion is, is that eventually with a seasoned therapist, you will meet resistance. Uh, so you, you, you access that childhood memory where a person has a hard time bringing it up. The memory is too horrible. They feel shameful about it. It's too repulsive to face in the light of day. Uh, what note, what's, what Freud noticed and his colleagues were this, this idea of repression, that we tend to eject those painful ideas or memories from our conscious awareness, but when we eject them, we don't inject them out of their, our brains completely. We eject them or propel them into the unconscious or the subconscious. And so, and Freud is going to go on to suggest a number of different repression mechanisms. And so you've heard of these in your general psychology textbook and maybe your abnormal psych class as defense mechanisms. So repression, regression, reaction formation, sublimation, you've heard of a lot of these things already in your past. Uh, another uh, aspect of this uh psychoanalytic relationship or this therapeutic relationship between Freud and his clients or patients is going to be transference. So the idea of transference is that there is this trusting healthy relationship that exists where a client needs to develop a personal intimate relationship with patient and therapist. When I say intimate there, I don't mean sexual intimacy. I mean a trusting intimacy where you could, you know, literally open yourself up and share these thoughts, feelings, emotions, behaviors, recollections, and memories with that therapist. And so Freud is going to suggest that the transference is vital because if the if the client or the patient doesn't trust the therapist, including Freud, then you're never going to get anywhere. By the way, there's another term in psychotherapy called countertransference, and that's a no-no. That's where the therapist starts to develop feelings more than just professional for the patient. And so the patient needs to develop some feelings of trust and intimacy, but not sexual. Feelings of trust and intimacy with the therapist, but that vice versa, that countertransference is not typically regarded as a good thing. So in the psychoanalytic approach in terms of dream theory, here are some just some ideas that Freud uh, posited made popular. So dreams tell us something about uh, what we want in life. They are fulfillment of repressed desires and wishes. And so things that we don't say or talk about or achieve at our normal waking hours, Freud would suggest that we dream about. We will fulfill those repressed wishes and desires in our dreams rather than during our waking hours. And so just a, a really quick overview of some of Freud's key ideas here. The manifest content would be the story that you would tell. So I had this dream last night and I dreamed I bungee jumped off a bridge. Okay, so that could be the manifest content, the story that you tell. And the latent content would be that thing that Freud or a therapist would help you understand. 
Well, jumping off a bridge was an indicator of, well, there it is at the bottom of the screen, giving into erotic w wishes as you're falling and flying through the air. And that desire for sexual achievement. And now I really highly regret using that bungee jumping example. But anyway, we'll play it out. And so the latent content would be the interpreted meaning of those dreams. And so you can see those small bullet points here at the bottom of the page or the screen, dreams have symbols, and some but not all symbols are universal. So over time and over hundreds and thousands of patients and clients, Freud would develop this kind of factor analysis in his head of what these things meant. And so, and it's not that uh, overly creative, uh, or I mean, if, as you read it, it kind of makes sense to you that if you're dreaming about gardens, balconies, and doors, that might be the female body, church spires, candles, and serpents, the imagery there is pretty clear. You're dreaming about male genitals. And so uh, Freud would become the interpreter of dreams. He would become the, he would take the, the manifest content and be able to understand the latent content. And so falling would be giving into erotic wishes. Flying would be the desire for sexual treatment. So if you have this dream, I don't know, sometime in your future, where you're flying through the air and you bust through some balcony doors and you fall onto a church spire, whew, you're having quite a dream and you might want to think about that one. All right. But don't be dreaming about bungee jumping. I already regret that one. All right. The interesting thing about Sigmund Freud, amongst all the interesting things that we've been talking about already, is that Sigmund Freud sees himself as a researcher. If you read about his writings, he really doesn't see himself so much as a therapist, but as a researcher. But the therapy is the method by which he's collecting his data. So it's really interesting because researchers later are going to come along and criticize Freud. And that's fine. They can criticize Freud. And what Freud does is he dismiss, dismisses those criticisms and gets away with it. And we'll talk about the zeitgeist of that. But uh, Freud sees himself as a researcher. So his methods of research are different from psychology because psychology at the time that Freud is alive doesn't really have that interest level. Again, you know, Freud dies 1939. Psychologists really come into their own in the treatment of human behavior six years later in 1945. So Freud derives his theories from his clinical observations by seeing patients and clients. The system of psychoanalysis really is Freud's alone. I mean, he invents that thing. He popularizes it. He brought draws it together from different disciplines and subdisciplines in me medicine. He makes it world-renowned. And the zeitgeist to the time, Freud was able to get away with that. He does not respond to outside criticisms. And so people like Breuer and uh, Adler and Jung, when they disagree with Freud, they ha they leave. It's, it's pretty much a like it or lump it. And so Freud doesn't hold a gun to your head and say, hey, believe what I believe. If you don't want to believe about id, ego, and superego, that's fine. You don't have to. No one's making you do that. And so the system of psychoanalysis is really Freud's alone. He doesn't respond well to outside criticisms. Just to give you a really quick overview, because hopefully you've probably studied this stuff in a lot of different classes, but just a quick overview about psychoanalysis. The Freudian instincts, which is not the same thing as an instinct the way we, we would use it, are going to be these big, broad ideas like the life instinct, which is eros. And so the word erotic comes from that same root word. The death instinct is thanatos. And so when that death instinct is turned outward, it's usually aggression, hate, hatred, hate crimes, terrorism. That destructive force turned inward would be suicide or someone being masochistic. There are this unconscious and conscious aspects of personality. Uh, the, the classic iceberg, where you see the tip of the iceberg, that's the classic analogy that we use with Sigmund Freud for consciousness. That's the visible portion. It's very small. It's insignificant to the relative and complete size of the iceberg. It's superficial. That unconscious is that vast, powerful, contains those instincts, the eros, the thanatos. The preconscious for Freud would have been not repression of the consciousness, easily available. It's kind of like in the back of your mind. It's not what you're thinking about, but it's just bubbling right below that surface. It's not repressed fully. It's easily available with a little bit of effort. 
Um, I'm actually not going to go into this too much because I'm guessing that you've studied this in 14 other psychology classes. So the id is that basic energy. The ego is the mediator. Uh, and the classic analogy here is the rider on the horse. And so the id is the horse. It's the raw essence of power. The ego is the rider on the horse that tries to, you know, control the horse, guide the horse, steer the horse, not let the horse get out of control. You've got id, ego, and superego. Superego develops during childhood. Here's that developer of, of of one's conscience, as opposed to conscious, uh, one's conscience, that sense of right or wrong behavior is initially guided by parental control, but then ev eventually a young adult needs to take over and rather than do what's right or wrong by parents, do what's right or wrong by this internalized notion of right and wrong. The ego, as you can see there in the sub bullet, has protective defenses called defense mechanisms, uh, which researchers come along after Freud and actually have some very good success in verifying through an empirical process the existence of these de defense mechanisms. Again, I'm just going to do this really briefly because I, I think if, you know, the more I talk about it, I'm reminded about it. And I hope, hopefully the more that you study, you can really see the vast contributions that Sigmund Freud makes and the lasting influence that he has in the history of psychology. So in addition to id, ego, and superego, he has this notion of stages of personality development. Uh, and what happens is that if something happens during a particular stage and it's not resolved later on, uh, the adult disorder or the adult malady that a person experiences is linked to that childhood experience. Just to give you a quick example, so the oral stage is from birth to two years old for, in terms of Sigmund Freud. And so a child at that time is stimulated by sucking, biting, swallowing. These are sources of satisfaction. And so if something were to happen during that stage from zero to two to a child, um, Freud might take that leap that, well, that's where smoking will come from uh, as an adult behavior because the oral stage wasn't resolved properly, kind of like not getting through that complex and so if someone gets stuck in the oral stage or there's a traumatic event during one's oral stage, ages zero to two, then that person might turn into a smoker or they may overeat because uh, they get that sense of, sense of satisfaction from sucking, biting, swallowing, that kind of thing. Anal stage from two to four years old. And here's where we come up with that term that I like to use about myself from time to time, anal retentive, that excessive need clean uh, compulsive behaviors that you see. And so... That's the anal stage, the phallic stage, four to five years old. Here's where the Electra and the Oedipus complex are going to occur. And so again, if you don't resolve this Oedipus complex during the phallic stage of psychosexual development, then there's going to be a problem later on in adulthood. Then, and this is kind of a, this kind of blows away most developmental psychologists. It's almost like during this period of five to 12 years old, nothing occurs, what Freud would call the latency period. And then the genital stage begins around age 12 is where you typically see the emergence of heterosexual behaviors. In Freud's writings, in, in Freud's writings, by the way, he doesn't actually talk a whole lot about homosexual behaviors, and so that's I just note that there, beginning, beginning around page page twelve, beginning around age twelve, you typically see uh, what what Freud would call the genital stage and those heterosexual dating behaviors, interested in, interest in the opposite sex, and so forth. So, as we start down the trail to wrap this up. The conflicts between psychoanalysis and psychology. Well, first off, there's just a lack of parallel progress. They really are different in independent disciplines. You know, and, and, and to draw that down further, psychoanalysts go to med school. They're trained as physicians, as medical doctors. They're not psychologists. They don't go to psychology grad school. They're not PhDs. They're MDs. And so these two worlds, MDs and PhDs, and this continues to this day, by the way, they speak and they think in different terminology. They have a different jargon. They don't share the same uh, terms and operational definitions for the things that they encounter in their professional lives. Early psychology, again, was very method-centered. It was trying to be more like physics, and so to understand equations and formulas and the structure and function of the human mind, the laws of human behavior. They wanted precise operational definitions. You know, like physics had F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. Well, psychology wanted those. They didn't really get them until the 40s and 50s with Clark Hall and behaviorism, but, um, and neo-behaviorism. But psychology strives for that. Again, psychology doesn't get really interested significantly in helping behaviors until 1945 in the uh, aftermath of World War II. 
psych psychoanalysis from the get-go is problem-centered. It helps to attempts to help these neurotic individuals, the people who have disorders and maladies, uh, mental illness, using concepts such as id, ego, and superego. That talking cure, the catharsis, the hypnosis, uh, dream dream analysis, free association, all these techniques that Freud brings together under this one big tent. The criticisms of psychoanalysis. Uh, again, uh, if you're a psychoanalyst, you don't believe these are criticisms, but outsiders looking in at psychoanalysis are going to say, well, first off, it's the method of data collection. I mean, you're, you're not really collecting data. You're not running subjects. You're not, uh, you know, this is uh, the method of data cl collection is seeing clients and patients. It's from case records. It's really what Freud could just remember. And you can understand that if you are working on your um theory of uh, theory development that day that you might only remember the things from client interviews and client sessions they're going to reinforce that and so there's a little bit of bias that could be happening there um, and that's going to be a criticism from the outsiders looking in on psychoanalysis and so you start to wonder about the validity of patient reports so is Freud only remembering things that are going to support his theories is he also remembering things that might refute his theories that's hard to know uh, when it's all case study and self-report Others are going to criticize Freud about the generalizations that he makes from data. And so when Freud himself has this experience as a four or five year old of hating dad and loving mom and wanting mom sexually, he labels it the Oedipus complex. Is it really justifiable to take one's personal life experiences and then generalize them to all of humanity? And so when Freud draws generalizations from his data, he just does it. And Freud doesn't explain it, uh, you know, and he gets away with it. The zeitgeist of the time is that Freud, you know, popularized things so well and became such a public figure that it's kind of like things that he, you know, proclamations that he made go unquestioned. And, and that's a really unique point in the zeitgeist and the development of the history of psychology. I mean, if someone else came along today and made kind of, you know, these amazingly large proclamations that involve massive amounts of behavior and thousands or millions of people, we'd want to know the data. We want to know how it's collected. We want to know, that, you know if it was a t-test or a one-way ANOVA. We'd want access to the data. Freud doesn't have to do that. And when people question him, Freud's basic response is, in essence, like it or lump it. You can like my theories, you can uh, you know adhere to them, or not. I really don't care. And Freud, again, because of the zeitgeist and the spirit of the times, is able to get away with that. In science, we don't like that. We want science to be precise and orderly. We want replication. We want an introduction, method, results, and discussion section. We want references at the end. Sigmund Freud wouldn't have written with a lot of references. Uh, his ideas were his ideas. And if you didn't like it, then don't believe it. Again, I've already kind of alluded to this, a criticism of psychoanalysis, a lack of operational definitions. You know, for science today, really, if we can't operationally define it, then that's really not a scientific concept, and we typically don't study it, at least with the rigors of empirical evidence and the methodology by which we draw conclusions. Uh, another criticism of psychoanalysis is going to be about the assumptions about human behavior. The definitions of key concepts are really ambiguous, id, ego, and superego. It's very degrading of women. So, for example, one of Freud's beliefs is that a woman has a poorly developed superego because she lacks a penis. And, and really a criticism that's going to, you know, kind of sweep around different parts of the world, including the United States, is that there's just too much emphasis on biological forces, especially sex. Because in the U.S., for example, late 1800s, you're having a very puritanical Victorian era, uh, era uh, so to speak. And so you have, you know, people wearing layers of clothes and they're very prim and proper. And then this guy from across the pond all of a sudden starts about talking about sex and sexuality. And it's very pervasive in his theories and in, in his ideas that he uh, promotes. And so that's going to be a criticism, at least from a U.S. perspective, about psychoanalysis and its infancy and its development. There's just too much about biology, and especially sex, and don't, uh, don't individuals have a little bit more free will? That's going to be the notion there. Now, contributions, I want to end on that note because I think they're huge. And again, as I've alluded to already, they still have a major contribution, major influence to this day. 
His influence on the development of psychiatry and clinical psychology. Certain concepts have gained wide acceptance in psychology, including, and you can see the list there, unconscious motivation, the importance of childhood experiences in shaping adult behavior, defense mechanisms, and just this whole notion of the unconscious or the subconscious. Not just the Freudian definitions, but you know, this, there's this level of consciousness. And so, in fact, you probably had a chapter in your intro psych textbook on states of consciousness, where you talked about sleep, where you talked about hypnosis, where you might have talked about dreams dream theories, uh, waking hours, uh, brainwave patterns, depending on what stage of sleep that you were in, REM sleep, things like that. A lot of that emphasis comes out of Freud's work and, and Freud's popularizing this no notion of consciousness. His impact on culture is huge. There is a gradual loosening of sexual restraint in behavior and art, literature and entertainment. If you think about the early 1900s in the U.S. in that prim, proper Victorian era, by the 1920s you see the revolt against that. You see speakeasies. You think about things like the Charleston and the Roaring Twenties. And so he's going to have an impact on culture that remains to this day. Society started to believe that uh, repressing, repressing your sexual desire and satisfaction is a bad thing. It would be harmful. The ironic thing, though, it's really kind of interesting, you know, when you have an idea and it becomes popular, you kind of lose control of it. And so if you actually read Freud carefully and you, you know, listen to him in his own words, uh, Freud's position was not to be wildly sexually active and promiscuous. He thought actually that you had to uh, control sexuality. I mean, it, it, that the inhibition of sex was necessary for the survival of civilization. And and so what we come to kind of think about with regard to Freud's ideas about sex and sexuality, you know, that it's important that it's a contributor to our later adult development and behavior and beliefs. Uh, Freud didn't believe in wild open sex. He didn't believe in that, that roaring 20s type of mentality, uh, even though it, it, it becomes associated with his beliefs uh, through different means throughout the history of psychology. Uh, his emphasis on sex helped to popularize his views that, and, and, you know, Madison Avenue picked up on this in the 20s, that sex sells. And sex sells still to this day, where you'll see ads and TV. Think about all the attractive people that you see in television ads and, and on the internet compared to unattractive people. I mean, think about it. Sex and sexuality sells very much to this day in our popular culture. Freud is really considered by, by many as one of the greatest originators of all time by some social science historians. I mean, his, that key contribution, if we had to summarize it into one big idea, that psychology was invaded by the principle of the unconscious process. But he developed so many other things as well, it's hard to put it all in one boat. I mean, I, like, I tend to think about, you know, dream analysis and free association and, and just the, the massive, you know, defense mechanisms. And so there's just a massive amount of uh, influence that Freud has had on the development throughout the 